So I have a teacher that I found in 1977, and I read his landmark book. It was a hippie book called Be Here Now. And it changed my life. I was, uh, by then, let's see, I read it in 77, so I was already old. <laughs> and, but, but the message was just stunning. And one of the stories that he tells is about a guy who has a painting of a sunset. Most of the painting is blah, gray, sort of like the way the morning was here, foggy, nothing. But in the right-hand corner of this painting is the most gorgeous swath of magenta. Just this, you know how in winter when you're walking and the sun is about to set and this purpley pink thing all of a sudden appears in the sky? The corner of this painting had this gorgeous swath of bright magenta. So the guy brings it to the framer and two weeks later he goes back and the framer says, you know, I didn't have a frame big enough so um, I had to fold over that pink thing. Scary that you would take a painting that had one beautiful thing in it and the frame isn't big enough and you fold it over the beauty. So you are not in charge of a lot of what happens to you in life. You're not in charge of your best friend getting cancer. You're not in charge of your father walking out. You're not in charge of breaking your leg. You're not in charge of your grandmother dying in front of you. You're not in charge of any of those things. But you are in charge of how you respond to all of those things. And that is what the size of the frame is. So you push out the frame and you see it from another point of view. Not that you get to skip the sorrow. Not that you get to skip the sorrow. So I've, start, I've been doing a, a writing workshop called Writing from the Heart for years. And for years I have started by saying we're alchemists, we turn shit into gold. We take what happened to us. And it, it, the workshop has lots of 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds, 70-year-olds, 40-year-olds, but every week there's somebody 14 and there's somebody 18 and there's somebody 22. So there, it's a smattering of humans. So... What do you do when something huge happens and you have a broken heart? We're alchemists. We get a chance to transform it. We get a chance to take what happened and turn it into something beautiful. You can paint it. You can sculpt it. You can dance it. In my workshop, we write it. The only thing is, the most important part of the equation is, first, you have to feel it. We live in a culture that is terrified of sorrow. We live in a culture that is terrified of pain. You got a pain, we got a pill for you. I didn't have a television for a long time, and when I turned on the television and I saw the ads for medicines to make you feel better as opposed to feel the way you feel, I was horrified. Because your feelings are just about the most important part of you. And they're yours, and no one can tell you not to feel them. So that's how I started the workshop. I always said we're alchemists, we turn shit into gold, we take what happened, and we, but first you have to feel it. So five years ago, I, my son died. Uh, I need a tissue. Anybody have a tissue? We'll get one. Thank you. <laughs> so he was sick. He got diabetes at nine months old. At 22, he got MS. By 25, he was in a wheelchair. By 27, he had brain surgery because his hands were tremoring and he couldn't feed himself. By 29, he couldn't pee anymore, so we had to catheterize him. And then, because we were catheterizing him, he got a urinary tract infection that went onto his aortic valve, and we ended up having to give him open heart surgery. He was like Job. Everything that could happen. Thank you, sweetheart. I'll just start with that. No, I'm just kidding. I told you I was funny. So, or she told you I was funny. So all those years of starting the workshop by saying we're alchemists, we can turn shit into gold. So then five years ago, I, I probably should tell you the great part about this. He was angry his whole life. He was angry because he got diabetes and we indulged him. We did what parents should not do, which is, oh my God, he's sick. What can we do to make him better? How can we make him healthy? What can we do so he doesn't hurt anymore? So life is easier. Parents do that, you can't help yourself, but it was wrong. And it made him very spoiled and very indulged and he was pretty sure that the world owed him a living. And he was angry because no kid wants that kind of power. 
And we gave him that power because we had no clue as to how to do this. It was very, very difficult. We didn't go to shrinkage. We didn't have help. We just sort of did it by the seat of our pants and we did a lot of things wrong. So he was very angry. When he got really sick, at first, very, very, very angry. I'm gonna fucking kill myself. He must have said that five billion times. I'm gonna fucking kill myself. I can't fucking do this. Something shifted. As he got sicker, he started to surrender. And he became so beautiful and so wise and so willing to have this illness and be where he was as opposed to trying to push it away. He, was, he became our teacher. And that happens often. Illness can become a teacher. In fact, I'll give you one quick story. He used to say, why me? Why me? Why fucking me? Why me? Constantly. I'm talking about years of his being sick, screaming, why me? When he started to surrender and become OK with his situation, by now he was bedridden. He was young. I walked into his room and I said, OK, I got a question for you. You can't walk. You can't feed yourself. You can't hold a fork. Now you have two bed sores the size of golf balls. You can't get out of bed. You can't get into the wheelchair anymore. Now you have swallowing issues. Your girlfriend left you. I just want to know why you. And he kind of paused and he looked at me. And he said the most profound thing a person could say. He said, why not me? I said, I'm calling dad. And I called my husband and I said, OK, he's a guru. He just became a wise man. For him to get it, that he wasn't a victim, nobody chose him to be the suffering one, it just happened. So anyway, all those years of starting the workshop, we're alchemists, we turn shit into gold, da 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 da. Dan dies five years ago. And I kind of didn't weep right away. You know, he'd been sick for so long. And I, I maybe, <laughs> Maybe there was some relief. I can't even describe the emotions, but I, I didn't get on the ground and just lose it. And then a girlfriend of mine offered me a drumming workshop in, uh, in Florida. And she said, it's a healing workshop, go. And I already had a backache. And I was making jokes and saying, Dan's got my back. And then I got an airplane. Airplanes kill my back. And that, when I got off the airplane in, Flo in Florida, I was like, oh, my back, my back. On the floor for 10 days chanting, it was not a good thing for the back. I got home and I was on the floor for six weeks. I did the Alexander Technique books under my head. I did acupuncture. I did chiropractic. I did everything. And I'm lying there in pain for at least 10 days. And on the 10th day, I'm lying there immobile, in pain. And I'm thinking, we're alchemists. We turn shit into gold. But first, you have to feel it. The teacher has to feel it. I was skipping the sorrow part. Even though I'd been teaching it for year after year after year, I was skipping the part I was saying, you have to feel the sorrow. Culturally, they don't want you to. They would much rather have you take a pill. But sorrow makes you compassionate. If you don't feel your own pain, how are you going to know what it's like for somebody else? So anyway, that, that was a huge lesson for me. When I first started writing, I do swear. I know that you know that. It's, it's, it's too late for me to apologize. It's part of my language. I grew up in the 50s. In the 50s, girls were supposed to sit like this. And their hair was supposed to be perfect. And they were supposed to giggle. And they were never supposed to say fuck, because that would be a terrible thing. Well, I was very tall. And I was more friends with the guys, and I just couldn't play by the girly rules. So it became part of my speech, my rhythm. And my mother, when I would give talks afterward, Nancy, do you have to use those words? And I would go, I do, Mom. I do, because they're, now they're part of my language. I can't help it. I know they embarrass you, so I'll say something to the people first. Like, there will be swearing. And if you have to leave, and I gave a talk to nuns once. And of course, and, and I, I, they were in lay clothing. A couple of them were in habits, but you know, I did my usual and so the fucking thing. And I went, oh no, oh no, I'm so sorry. And they went, what, are you kidding me? You think that we don't talk like that? And I was like, <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. So anyway, when I first sent stuff out to be published, and I was old, I wasn't young, I always wrote. I always wrote. The first poem I ever wrote, I have to tell you. 
Um, we weren't allowed to buy Hallmark cards. We had to make our own cards in our household. So I'm seven years old. I'm making a birthday card for my mother. I have no brother. I have a sister named Margie. I made my mother her birthday card, and she got the card, and she opened it up, and it said, Happy birthday to mom, to mom, from Margie and Nancy and Tom and Tom. <laughs> so my mother looked at it, and she said, Oh, honey, this is wonderful, but who's Tom? And I remember at seven rolling my eyes and going, oh, it rhymes with mom. <laughs> and I also remember my mother lighting up and saying, of course. She could have nipped the writer in the bud. She could have said, you can't do that. And parents do that. They take the little poet in you and they can squash you. They don't even know what they're doing. Fifth grade teachers do it. Ninth grade teachers do it. Priests do it. Everybody in power can take your perfect, perfect soul, your poetic, genius soul, and squash it in a second. Anyway, fast forward to I start sending things out finally, and the first editor I sent my stuff to calls me on the phone, and he says, I'd like to meet you. I'm going to talk about your piece. Um, this is interesting. He said, I'll meet you at Butterfly Restaurant. Until recently, I didn't realize butterfly transformation. Butterflies, they go from what? Thank you. To a butterfly. I had a life transformation at this meeting. So I go in. He's got my manuscript. We called it a manuscript. He's got my manuscript on his desk. I'll pretend this is the manuscript. And we say our hellos. How do you do? Da 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 da. -da. He said, um, okay, let's talk about your piece. Um, this. And he, and he draws a semicircle at the whole top. He goes, this is shit. I'm like, this is what an editor does? I mean, I, 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 nobody's ever talked to me like this. He goes, this, and he circles the whole bottom. He goes, this is garbage. Why did the guy call me and tell me to meet him? He just wants to insult a person. I am sitting there in shock ready to bolt, looking for the exit. And then he circles the whole center and he goes, this, this is gold. So I said, you are. It's not you doing what everybody tries to do, which is to seem like they know stuff. I don't need that. This is a human being I've never met before. I want to know her more. So when I do workshops, and we're going to do like a mini sampler because we don't really have that much time, but when I do them, I tell this story and I say, I want your voice. I don't want you to try to show me how smart you are or to use big words or to worry about spelling or to worry about punctuation. It's not what writing's about, especially now when you can do spell check and everything else. You just write. My workshop is called Writing from the Heart. So it goes from here, the brain, which stores the information. This is a very good computer. But then you go to your heart, which is where all the emotions are. Then you go to your gut, which is the truth. Your gut, when you get a stomach ache, when someone says something to you, it's because they lied to you. This stomach ache tells you something's wrong. Pay attention to your stomach. And then you go to the page. If you go back up here, guess who's up here? Your seventh grade teacher who told you that you weren't good enough. Your Uncle Max who told you you weren't going to ever write. All of the negative remarks that have ever been made to you are stored here because it's a computer. And when you go to do anything creative, if that sensor jumps out and interrupts you, it has taken the power away from you. And that's why if you start here, stay here stay here and go to the page. You cannot be wrong with creative work. If you draw the tree and it's orange, it's not wrong. There are no rules with creative work. There are rules with spelling. There are rules with math. Two and two is usually four. But when it comes to creativity, you are you. Well, I say usually because I think there are, my husband's a scientist and he will go for hours showing me how it could be five and yet, you know, just. We are an interesting match. Um, I proposed to him 49 years ago. And then I begged, I have to say. I did. Well, he, we would still be dating. <laughs> he, he was not going to do it. So I finally just had to say, um, 
I think we're life partners. Now, how in 1965, before you were born, how did I know a phrase like life partners? I said, I know we're life partners. And he said, I know I want you to be the mother of my children. And I said, yeah, but you could be married to someone else and I could be the mother of your children. That won't work for me. I am begging you. I want to marry you. And every time I saw the cars with the wedding things and the tin cans and everything, I'd start crying and he would roll his eyes. I got him, though. I got him in 1967. We got married. <laughs> I got him. I nailed him. I love him. I, I was totally right, too, because he's an amazing human being. And how did I know? Because young people always ask me, how did I know? He was kind. He was honest. And he was funnier than me. I came home and I said to my mother, Mom, Joel's funnier than me. I have to have him. And I fell in love with the family because they were like so, their values were so great. I grew up and we had no money. And so to me, wall to wall carpeting, oh, you know, cars, a, bit, a new car, all of the wrong stuff I valued because I grew up hungry. He grew up in the same economic, his parents made the same money my parents made. He grew up thinking he was rich. And I grew up thinking I was poor. All attitude. My parents were constantly <coughs> wishing they had more. His parents were satisfied and joyous. So I remember saying to my mother, look, there are three brother, four brothers all together. I want Joel. But if I can't get Joel, I've got to get into that family. I'll take one of the other brothers. <laughs> I got Joel. I got Joel. Anyway, I think maybe we should write, because time is going to go fast. Um, this is the assignment. Oh, wrong word. This is the exercise. Assignment sounds like school. This is the exercise that I give all the time. It's the first one. It's so powerful and so real, but I am begging you to take the chance of being honest. We probably will not get a chance to write the whole piece, and we won't get a chance to read them all out loud. I'll probably get three people to read a couple of lines each just to show you. Well, you know what? I'm just going to go backwards just a touch. I was in a writing workshop many, many years ago. It wasn't a workshop. It was a group. And they invited me to be in there. And I was thrilled. When they called and asked me, it was like they were all professional writers. They were all published writers. I was blown away that they were including me. Oh my god, I can't. I got off the phone and I'm screaming through the house. I have to lose 15 pounds before Wednesday. You do not have to be thin to be a writer. That is my ill issue. So let go of that one. Then I said, what is a writer wear? What am I going to wear? Black. I'll wear black because writers wear black, so I wore black. And I get there. And this woman, pre, you know, this is a 14 women that have been meeting for years, so they know each other intimately. This woman reads her piece. She had been chosen beforehand, so every week they say, you know, Myra, bring your piece next week. Judy, bring your piece next week. She reads her thing. It's gorgeous. Stunning writing. I know good writing. Fabulous writing. She finishes reading, and the first person sounds like this. You know, Stephanie, I felt that your characters were really rather one-dimensional. <laughs> I mean, I couldn't relate to them. And I sat there and I was like, whoa. And then one by one, everyone in that room found something to criticize her. It blew me away, because the piece was great. I didn't open my mouth because I didn't want them to say, oh, she's a Pollyanna. Oh, she thinks everything's great. I was like, I, 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 I'm not going to say anything. Then they chose someone else for the next week. And I get there. And this woman reads, honest to God, the piece was fabulous. Really good writing. Guess what? Same thing happened. The first person who spoke must have gone to the same surgeon to have her jaw wired shut. Because she said, you know, Harriet, I really have to admire your perseverance. I mean, you just don't quit, do you, dear? <laughs> I'm not kidding. She said that in my ears, heard it. And I'm sitting there going, whoa, 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 this can't be real. One by one, everyone in that room told her something that was wrong with the piece. Blew me away. And afterwards, that first week, they had peach cobbler. I'm into food heavily. Hot peach cobbler with vanilla ice cream pouring over the thick crust with buttery stuff. I glommed that peach cobbler and I got home and my husband, I told you he's great. I walk in the door, he goes, how was it? I said, oh my God, the peach cobbler was fabulous. <laughs> he goes, no babe, the writing thing. And I said, mean spirited. So this time afterwards, they had a blueberry thing. 
with the wild Maine blueberries, sweet, tiny, sweet, sweet, sweet. And I glommed, and I had blue teeth, and I got home, and my husband said, how was it? And I said, oh, I gotta get the recipe for this blueberry thing. He said, no, babe, the writing. How was the writing thing? And I said, they're not nice. It's actually worse than school. Worse than the worst school. And he said, are you going back? And I said, oh yeah, I'm reading next time. <laughs> he said, you're not nervous? And I said, no, they won't do it to a new person. <laughs> I'll get the tissues ready. So I went with the best thing I'd ever written. I didn't go with an iffy thing. I didn't go with something in process. I went with something I thought they were going to flip out over and say, oh my god, she's brilliant. It's so cool that we asked her to be here. I finished reading, and they did a job on me. And while they did a job on me, when each person said something, this is what I did. I took notes as if they knew what they were talking about. Like they're the authority. So someone said something and I went, oh, wow, yeah, yeah, I hadn't, hadn't thought of that. Mm-hmm. Mm, well, thank you. I actually thanked them. With the stake in my heart, I was thanking them. And then someone else said something and I was like, um, right, right, wow, I just hadn't realized. Wow, oh, th thank you for that. Whoa, whoa, stake is twisting in my heart. I'm bleeding to death now. <laughs> The third person said something, and I, oh, yeah, absolute, insightful, to not realize what a piece of shit this actually was. I didn't say that. I thought that with my broken heart. And I, I didn't write for two years. Nothing, nothing, nothing. They, they, they literally, even though I knew they were wrong, even though I knew they were mean, they got to me. You can give over your power so easily and I gave over my power. They were mean. So I didn't write for a long time and then finally something happened. I got an obscene phone call which means nothing to you because now there's the internet and you can see anything you want. But in my day, in 1902, whatever it was, I got an obscene phone call and it was very, very weird. Should I tell you about it? I'll tell you about it. Let me just show you. Am I gonna corrupt these children? No, you're already corrupted. I, I could tell. So the phone rings and I got little kids and I got the dog is yipping and the oil is bubbling on the stove and, and I, uh, I answered the phone but I couldn't, hear, I couldn't hear the guy and he said something. I said, I'm sorry, what did you say? And he repeated it and I couldn't hear him and I said, you know what, I'm gonna take it in the den. I turn off the stove. I tell the kids, when I go into the den, hang up the phone. I go into the den, I shut the door, and I said, hi, now what, what did you say? I'm so sorry, I couldn't hear you, it's crazy here. He said, can I sight your tip, baby? Like I said, I couldn't even say it, it was so weird. Well, because it was so violent, and so frightening, and so horrible, but because I had talked to him for so long, I just couldn't hang up. And I said, do you have any idea what this kind of phone call does to a person? You cannot do this anymore. And he said, I, th I thought girls like this. I said, well, there might be some. You have to find them. Meanwhile, do you know me? And he said, no. And I said, how did you get my name? And he said, I got it from the phone book. And I said, well, thank you for telling me that because at least I'm calm now because I'm not worried that you've been following me. You can't do this anymore. This is a terrible, violent, this is like a phone rape. You can't do this anymore. Please tell me you're not going to do this anymore. And he said, uh, 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 I'm sorry. And I said, good for you. I appreciate that so much. And I hung up. Oh, right at the very end of the thing, I said, I'm going to hang up now. And he goes, later. And I'm like, no, not later. <laughs> but do you remember the expression, later? That's what he said, it was later. Hung up the phone. I go back to the table, my kids are young, they're like nine and 11, and I tell the family what happened. And I'm in such a great mood because I have just been honest with somebody. I have been vulnerable. I didn't scream at him. I, I told him what it felt like. And he was actually a human being behind all that violent talk. And he apologized. It was an amazing exchange. If I had hung up, it wouldn't have happened. So every time I told a girlfriend about it, they would go, wow, that's, I usually just hang up. Because that's, this is what used to happen a long time ago, before the internet, people called people on the phone. And so I realized the more I talked about it, the more it was a unique response 
to something that was scary. And I knew I had done something cool. So I wrote it. And I taped it. And I sent it to a major radio station. And they aired it. And I have to tell you that I got every door opened for my life. I got job after job after invitation to speak after I, I got to teach at Harvard. Me, I would not have gotten into Harvard, excuse me. Teach at Harvard. Anyway, it was the honesty and the vulnerability, which is what you want in your life. Anyway, I get home. We, we went broke. My husband and I had money for about eight years. It was phenomenal. I got... I realized that when we went broke, I needed to get a job. I got a fabulous job at a magazine. I moved to New York. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. Friday, I get fired. I worked there five days, and I got fired. And the managing editor said, she's manic. She's manic. She's manic depressive. I didn't know what that was at the time. It wasn't a phrase that people knew. He said, she hired you on an up day, and she fired you on a down day, and she fired eight other people. It's not you, Nancy. It still felt like it was me. I went back to Hartford, where I'm from. Anybody from Hartford? Nobody. Got home, very, very embarrassed, very ashamed. Bumped into people who knew I had gotten this great job in New York. Very unhappy. I was getting this huge money. I started telling people what had happened. And every time I told it, I added a couple of things to it. It got funnier, it got cuter, it got Bigger, the story got deeper, because you know when you tell us when you're a storyteller, you embellish a little. So my editor called me and he said, What happened? And I said, Ugh. And I told him. And he said, Go home and write it. And I said, I can't. I'm too raw. He said, Go home and write it. I said, No, my heart's broken. He said, Go home and write it. It's the best thing I've ever written before, since, or during, or what I'm gonna write. And that is because it was so raw. I was so present with the pain. So if you're going through stuff, don't even think about publishing. Get it on the page. Get it out of your body. You carry this stuff. It's weighty. It goes to your pancreas. It goes to your heart. It goes to your liver. You don't need to carry the sorrow and the fear. Get it on the page. Get it out of your cells. Get it on to the page. And doesn't, doesn't mean it goes away. It's a wound, but it's not who you are. So I suggest just keeping a journal. If those of you who already journal, it's a great way of finding out who you are, and it's a great way to heal, and it's a great way to see what you're stuck on, what you keep doing over and over and over again. Got home, started a writing workshop. Same thing happened in my writing workshop. They tore each other apart. Blew me away. What I learned from that was creativity requires safety. So now in my workshops, I have one rule, and that is when you finish reading, you will be safe. We have one rule. I will tell you what we loved. That's it. So we're going to write. So you have these uh, journals that um, Marianne got for you. I can't lift it. Maybe somebody just passed these guys out. Some of them have words. Pick a journal. Get a pen. We're going to write shortly, quickly, briefly. And while you're passing those, I brought, um, I brought a CD of me not singing, you'll be happy to know, uh, uh, of my NPR pieces. So they're short, little. Well, you might want to, yeah, OK. Their little ones are very cute, and you can draw on them, and you can make little. You're more apt to carry the little one in your bag than you are the schlepping big ones. And can you pass those to that side? Thank you. And, and those two. Just throw it. Don't wound anybody. If you get a basket. Pretty good, pretty good. No prize, but pretty good. So everybody has one? OK, so oh, he doesn't have one. That wasn't a good throw, was it? Now you need a book, right?
Yeah. Oh, you got one? Oh, okay, okay, let me, I want to do it. So you're going to listen, and it's called writing from the heart, but it could be called listening from the heart. And I'm going to talk about what I hear, but I want you to listen as well and give, um, can you pass me that book? Thanks. And give feedback to the person who's uh, read. So again, you can't be wrong. And the only rule is whoever's reading, you're going to tell them what you loved. So you're going to read first, and loud and clear and slowly, but could you say your name? Tanya. Tanya, cool. Okay, so loud and clear and slowly, please. Dinner at our house is often a mess of what I can scavenge, and what my brothers request. A mess of what I could scavenge? Yeah. Fabulous. My little brother sits at his computer, cobwebs, cobwebs growing around him, Everything void of movement, save for his frantic eyes being illuminated by the screen and tireless hands moving about the keys. In the rare moments that he actually decides to talk to the family, is request. Mom, I'm hungry. Mom, mom, mom. The assortment of moms escape his mouth, and I can't help but feel sad. I want him to talk to me. I want to feel like a sister. It's brilliant. I can't believe I caught, I mean, I, you know, I, I have good instincts, I swear, because the first person should be good. <laughs> Absolutely gorgeous. Using mom, 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 having us hear voices, very, very important to have dialogue, to have people talking. But starting with a mess of what I could scavenge, look how much she told us. It's not easy in this, more, this place. Not easy. That means food is not laid out beautifully. That means the mother's either working or it's, she's not into it. Look how much she told in that one sentence. The other thing is she said sits. Read the sentence with he sits. My brother sits or something? Um, my little brother sits at his computer. OK. Yeah. My little brother sits at his computer. What happens when you use present tense? And believe me, I will never do school words again. But present tense sits as opposed to sat, because this is a story about the past. When you say my brother, my little brother sits at the computer, it brings you into the moment. There's an immediacy about it. It makes it so much more powerful. I am in love with present tense. I think. Take your stories, whenever you write, try to make it present tense because we jump right in. I'm at the table because of what you did. Um, the cobwebs is phenomenal. All right, it's your turn. What did you, could you hear her? She went fast. Okay, to anything uh, you want to tell Tanya that you loved? Not required, but if you heard something that you loved, please share. Oh, everybody, cool. It was good. What? An assortment. Yeah, which was great because that's what young kids, you, you know, he's younger. Mom, 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 mom. That's what kids do, mom, until they get the attention. So it was very believable, very real. And you were going to, somebody else was going to say something. So he thought it was cool, which is great. Any, any specific reason? Just that it was cool. It was good. It was good. Yeah. Yeah, we get, we get that he actually commands most of the attention at the table, most of the time. In that short piece, she gave us the mess, the word scavenge was a perfect word choice, and she gave us a character of a kid who's more into the computer because there's nothing more compelling than what he's got right here. You did a great job. Thank you. So I think... I think you have to go, even though it was the smallest book I've ever seen in my entire life, and you probably have six words, right? Look at this book. <laughs> Say your name to the humans. I'm Ryan. Or actually, they probably know you, but I don't. Ryan, good. Um, dinner at our house is rushed and often hated. I sit next to my twin and my annoying sister who fights for the better wooden chair. Because as an 11-year-old, she needs it for her back pain. <laughs> no, this is, this is, I mean, I know you laughed, but right away, this is, a, this is painful. To have a sibling that's got control over the family because of an illness, 
and maybe it's not even true because you could hear it in his voice. Go ahead. I, I didn't mean to s stop you. Go ahead. Um, well, she regales her story on how someone stepped on her head during recess. Sean makes a comment on how someone said they saw me hitchhiking to school, and I jumped to the fence on over they should be happy I was trying to get to school. Um, I eventually back down and say I'll never again. Fan, t I'm telling you, you just did a phenomenal thing. Now we got his character, which is he got busted hitchhiking. <laughs> and he says in defense, you know, at least I was trying to get to school. <laughs> so we got attitude, but we have some th that he has to, like, defend himself from hitching. Um, you have to read it again. The piece is fabulous, absolutely fabulous. You, so are you a writer? Uh, you want to be a writer? Yeah. Good. Please, do it. <laughs> I'm not kidding. This is a gifted guy. Go ahead. Uh, read what you read it all over again. Rushed and um, dinner at our house. Dinner at our house is rushed and often hated. I sit next to my twin and my annoying sister who fights for the better wooden chair because, as an 11 year old, she needs it for her back pain. Wow. While she regales her story on how someone stepped on her head during recess, Sean makes a comment on how someone said they saw me hitchhiking to school. I jumped to the fence on over how they should be happy I was trying to get to school and then eventually back down and say I'll never hitchhike again. Fantastic. Fantastic. Because this is the peacemaker in the family. You already know his role. He already knows that the, to appease the parents, I'll never do it again. That if he fought harder, there'd be more of a scene. Um, uh, look how much we get in this short piece. This, the 11-year-old that has back pain What's that about? Is it real? Is she manipulative? He's pissed. She's got the better wooden chair. That means all the chairs aren't the same. Look how much he told us in this short, brilliant piece. Talk to him. Tell him what you loved. Anybody? I know I'm covering everything, but you can come up with something. Did you say rushed and hated? Yeah. As if the EDs, as if it were, you know, past, but it's very present. It's very now. Fabulous writing. Anybody have a comment? Even if you just want to say, I loved it, it's okay. I won't yell at you for not having a specific comment, comment. Come on, kids, you heard it. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Really great comment. Another, you're deserving another applause. Thank you. So why don't you read? Huh? You. Yeah, you. Yeah, I'm talking to you. <laughs> say, say your name. I'm talking to you. I'm Elijah. Oh, my, my uh, grandchild is Elijah. Well, it's Eli. Okay, go ahead. Loud and clear, slowly. Dinner at my house was lonely yet comforting. I come home, it's dark. A sense of happiness, yet you know. Things can always go downhill. <laughs> Loud and obnoxious. Satisfying and scary. Rooms are empty. Everybody's gone, but I know they'll come back. Wow, it's powerful. This is like a prose poem. It's stunning. Um, lonely yet comforting. So now we're immediately comforting because it's worse when they're there. Uh, you balance the whole piece. Read it again. And I'm not going to make comments. You guys are. So read it again, please. Oh, you can't because you spoke it. That's right. OK. That was good. That was good. Um, my, no, I, I, I get. I, I, saw, I saw that. It's OK. You did, you, it was fabulous what you did, um, which means that you probably will end up being a speaker because you did beautifully. It was very convincing. It was very well done. And of course, you can't repeat it because you said it and didn't write it. Yeah. No, that's great. You know, my, the kid, my son that died, took the workshop many times, and he did the same thing. He took my workshop, and I gave the exercise, write a page in your diary. And I know this is very girly, and guys don't keep diaries. And so I saw him, so then they were all writing, and there was one other guy in the class. Most of them were young women. I saw him smoking a cigarette with another guy. And he came back, and I called on him, and he had his pages, and he read just like you did, and it was fabulous, and the pages were blank. 
It's very gift. It's a gift to be able to do that. You'll probably end up being a speaker. Who wants to read? I know everybody does, but you do. You you read. No. <laughs> I know you don't want to, but you should. Say your name to the humans. Aurora. What is it? Aurora. Oh, gorgeous. I have an Aurora friend. <laughs> Our house is a single mother on a diet of low income and an expensive taste. Dinner at our house is a vegetarian daughter with extreme mood swings, trying to keep her, trying to keep them under control with medicine forced into her soul. Dinner at our house is lonesome, but somehow always full. Dinner at our house is an absent father who's kept silent. Stunning. It's stunning. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> this is why. I think it's beautiful. The repetition of dinner at our house was, dinner at our house was. When you use repetition um, intentionally, it's very powerful, and that's how you used it. If I said, I like your hat, I think hats are cool. I wonder where they sell hats like that. By the third hat, I'm going to throw up now. You cannot keep using the same words unless you do it on purpose because you're building. Every time she said dinner at our house was, it built and became more powerful. Starting with the single mom and then going to the vegetarian daughter, that was brilliant. I thought what you did was brilliant. Talk to her. Tell Aurora what you loved. Come on, gang. You know you just heard the same piece I did. Hi. This is the. She's, she, 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 she has a comment. I like how you like, expressed yourself about yourself at the table instead of like, I immediately would talk about other people. But it was also very honest and courageous yeah. to be able to write stuff that isn't happy, happy, joy, joy, and everything was perfect in my house. That's not great writing. It's not interesting. We all know that there's greatness and happiness in moments. But if you're willing to write the tough stuff, that's what makes your voice a one-of-a-kind voice and your story one. And it's also universal, the vegetarian daughter and the, and the low income and the working mother. It's very vulnerable. Vulnerability, when you are... When you are willing to say, this is who I am and this is what happened to me, we jump into your heart. That's the kind of reading I want to do. I want to read stuff that says, come on in. Because I want to say, oh, you're me. Even though our details are different, I want to know that we feel the same way. That we've all had something that betrayed us. We've all had a broken heart. We've all had disappointment. If you act like everything's fine, I A, won't believe you, and B, I don't give a fuck. There it goes again. Bad, bad girl, bad girl. Um, one more who wants to read. Look at their, no, no eye contact. They're, uh, she's going to make me read. Oh, I think you should read. Yes. Say your name to the humans. Patrick. <laughs> that sounded very 12 step ish right there. <laughs> Patrick Wilson. So, um, Dinner at my house is honestly something I avoid at all costs. So <laughs> my mom walked out, the house has um, quite literally gone to the dogs. A year and a half after she left to go off, go run off with her rich doctor boyfriend, my dad has replaced her with his own gold digger's delight, a frumpy oh. former school teacher and the full-time dog lady by the name of Jan. Quite obsessed by anything dog related, Jan continues to live with her mother at the ripe old age of 50. <laughs> it's fabulous. <laughs> fabulous. So you get irony, you get sarcasm, you're funny, and in the subtext, in between the lines, we get the pain. Since my mom ran off, when you said his own gold diggers, delight, delight was brilliant. And gone to the dogs, and then and then the woman is a dog thing. You didn't do that on purpose. This is what happens when when you sit down to write. You are not alone. When you do anything creative, do not think you are alone. If you are willing to sit down and begin the process of doing something a little more difficult for yourself, and if it's creative, you will have a partner in the universe. The phone will ring, and somebody will say the exact name of the river that you need to have. Somebody will drive by in the DeSoto that you needed, the car you needed. What just happened to him with dogs and dogs is brilliant. And he didn't plan it because he sat down and said, I'm going to write. Can you make a comment to Patrick about what he wrote? The rich doctor. Amazing. You're like 
confident in what you said, like you know the truth from you spoke it. You can write. Did you know this? Have, did you get good grades in, uh, how old are you? Uh, 16. And so you're still in school. Where are you from? Um, oh, it's that difficult to question? <laughs> <laughs> oh, from here? Yeah. Oh, well, you can come take the workshop. So did you get a postcard? Yes. Yeah. All right, here's what I have to say before we close. If you got the postcard, if you ever want to take the workshop, from wherever you're from, if you're far away or here, and you have no money, you call me on the phone and you say, Nance, remember when you were funny? <laughs> let's, let's keep that in mind. Uh, remember when you said I could take the workshop for nothing? I'm making that commitment to you right now. If you want to take the workshop, it is a life-transforming experience. You will laugh, you will cry, you will write, it will jumpstart you. You will meet unbelievable people. You will fall in love with everybody in the circle because everybody writes the truth. Everybody has a story. I will give it to you. I do it every week, all summer. The first one's July 6th. It's four mornings. I know you're probably all working. It's nine to noon, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So if you have a job and you can change a few days and you can get there at 1230, come to the workshop, call me on the phone and say I need to come. And you're in. Done. Finished. All right. Thank you. So I'm just gonna I'm just gonna tell one more story and then we're done. You guys, maybe everybody's a brilliant writer, but look, we everybody that read, the writing was incredibly beautiful and powerful. So maybe Marianne just chooses the smart guys to come here. I don't know how it works. I have one more cute story to tell you, and then we'll make closure. Um, having done this for all these years, I've learned a lot, and one of the things I've learned is that everyone has a wound. Everyone walking down the street, everyone has something that happened that hurt. Everyone. Nobody has gotten by scot-free. And after you have this wound, you then see the world through the prism of that wound. Now, my father died when I was really young. I see fathers and daughters everywhere. I have seen them since I was 15. He died in front of me in a minute. I see fathers and daughters. It's what I see, and every time I see it, it breaks my heart, and then I'm fine. I'm not walking around broken, but it, it's there, and it's how I see the world. I see the world through fathers and daughters, and then I'm fine. When I was dating Joel, because he's so healthy and his family's so healthy, I was trying to find out the deep stuff. You know, I was asking all these questions, and so I asked him, so what's the worst thing your mother ever did? He goes, Nance, the worst thing my mother ever did? You know my mother. My mother's amazing. And I'm like, yeah, she doesn't have a mother story. Everybody has a mother story. Nothing. So three months later, I go, what's the most embarrassing thing your father ever did? He goes, Nance, you know my father. I could never tell a story that he embarrassed me. My father's a hero to me. And I'm thinking, OK, he's a lightweight. Turns out he's not a deep guy after all. Can I marry a lightweight? Come on, who are you? And then one night, in this beautiful moment of vulnerability, in this voice that was like a little boy voice, he told me that he had been teased on the playground and that he had been called Dumbo because his ears stick out. And the voice was what I was looking for. Just, I just got the pain. That's all I wanted was the vulnerability that something hurt him so much that it scarred him. That's all I wanted. Walking down the street in Vineyard Haven a couple of years ago, and we see a father and two daughters coming toward us. I go through my usual, yeah, and we pass, and my husband goes, wow, did you see the ears on those kids? <laughs> my defense rests. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your huge hearts. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. And you, and where is he? And you. And all of you. <laughs>